In this video, I'm going to talk about how accessibility for disabled users applies to open educational resources. All of us, whether we're currently disabled or not, require accommodations, whether it's wearing glasses or using memory aids like notebooks and calendar reminders or taking the elevator when you break your foot. The only difference is that those accommodations are accepted as normal because it's convenient for the people who get to make decisions about what normal is. We have to create our open educational resources to be as universally accessible as possible, and when that fails, to be easily adapted to make an accommodation. Making all of our educational materials accessible to people with disabilities is required of us by law. The college can lose federal funding if we don't comply with the ADA and Section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act. Basically, we have to make all of our resources accessible, or if that's not possible, provide a reasonable equivalent, as long as it's possible to do that without going out of business or hurting the rest of our learners. But it's not just the law, it's also an ethical mandate and just basic human decency. At Empire State College, we consider the law's requirements the absolute minimum. We have always been committed to individualized and transformative learning, and accommodating disabilities is just part of that. Accommodating disabilities is part of the ethos of open educational resources. For something to be open means that it's meaningfully available to everyone. That means people in different countries, including the development wor developing world. It means people in poor communities, people who speak different languages, people with access to different technology, and people who have different accessibility needs. You can't ever hope to accommodate every possible accessibility need, much less accommodate all of them at once. You just have to try to maximize accessibility from the ground up and be agile about creating new accommodations on the fly. One important area to consider for accessibility is navigation of your open educational resource. You should be able to use all of its controls using the keyboard only. The tab order should make sense. The mouse controls shouldn't require lightning reflexes. Make your mouse over areas big enough and make the menu hold still while you mouse through it. Don't use pop-ups. If you're creating an OER, you can make sure that it is accessible. If you're adapting someone else's OER, you will have to check through the whole thing and possibly get an EdTech to help you make improvements. Another thing to consider is that everyone finds that they are more distractible online th than with physical resources. People who are neurodiverse, whether they have ADHD, an autism spectrum disorder, traumatic brain injury, or even depression, may have even more trouble with this. In the physical world, we move our eyes across and down pages. This engages our muscle memory. Online, we move the text relative to our eyes. With a physical model, we move it around organically. With a simulation, we move a mouse the same way we, we move the mouse to do anything else. So it's easy to understand why our brains have more trouble engaging with something on a screen than something that's right there with us. Furthermore, there's the idea of the threshold effect. Most people sometimes walk into a room and suddenly forget why they went in there. It turns out that's because our brains perceive a change in context and sort of dump the memory buffer. Well, every time we click next or back, we're very likely to activate that threshold effect. People who have short-term memory problems find this especially problematic. So the solution to the problem of online distractibility and forgetfulness is to assist people's concentration and short-term memory. In open educational resources, we can make sure to provide the information in shorter chunks. Shorter pages, shorter paragraphs, shorter sentences. You don't have to dumb down the content, just provide it in smaller bites. Also make full use of transitions to draw connections between the chunks of content. If the screen has changed, refer back to what you just said. Don't be afraid of repeating yourself a little. Summarize your points as you begin and again as you finish. And don't make people go looking for definitions or images that are associated with the text. Put them right there where they will be needed. You don't want them to scroll or cl click away and then have trouble remembering to come back. You can do these things in the OERs that you create, and when you adapt other people's OERs, you can revise them to meet these standards. Open educational resources, like all online learning materials, need to maximize the attention that the learners pay to the content they're supposed to be learning, and to minimize the attention they pay to, ha to using the tools and finding their way around. Don't make the navigation too clever. Use common words and symbols in obvious locations. Don't make people scroll around to find the menu or the next and back buttons. If you do find an OER that has fancy navigation, go through every possible page and option to make sure that it is consistent and simple. If you need to make changes that are beyond your technical ability, consult an EdTech. 
With text open educational resources, most of the accessibility issues are fairly simple. If you have a PDF file, you have to make sure it's readable. That means that you can search the text and screen readers can read it. If it's not readable, you can contact the Office of Accessibility Services for help converting it to be readable. Visually speaking, your text resources should have good contrast. There are tools on the web to check whether the, your color selections are high contrast enough. This is important for people with low vision and it reduces fatigue for everyone else. And there should be plenty of white space to facilitate easier eye tracking. This helps dyslexics, tired people, and anyone trying to read in a moving vehicle. As I said before, use shorter paragraphs and sentences and clear transitions and summaries too. Use visual cues in your text to mark off sections with headings and lists with bullets or numbers. In whatever editor you're using, be sure that you use the actual headings and bullets rather than just bold print and asterisks because the proper ones work with screen readers. With image and simple animation open educational resources, it is very important to provide a big image. That is because many low vision people will open up the full size image and scroll around in order to view it. This is also an advantage for anyone who wants to examine the image closely. You can provide a smaller image as an option for people with slow internet connections. And you can size the image to fit on the page using HTML. But the image should be as big as possible. Don't include images that are not content. In other words, nothing should be there just to be decorative. If you have to use decorative Im images, be sure that their alt text just says decoration so that people with screen readers don't waste time trying to figure them out. Which leads to my next point. Every single image needs to have alt text. And the alt text field should not be used for anything except providing the image description. The image description in the alt text needs to be useful for people who can't see, which means that people who can see are often bad at writing it. Here are some tips. If the image contains text, put the text in the alt text. Do not start your image description with image of or anything like that, because the screen reader is going to say that automatically. Don't worry too much about how long it will take to read the alt text, because screen readers have speed settings. Experienced users frequently listen at very high speed, and they need to get all the content. And finally, people who can't see don't care as much about the appearance as about what the appearance signifies. For diagrams and many kinds of artistic and scientific imagery, you will need to be very skillful in creating your descriptions in the alt text. There are blind educators out there who explain the best ways to describe different kinds of images, and you can Google some of them. Try Googling AEB's guidelines for verbal description for some really good general advice. Sometimes alt text is not enough of an accommodation for an image in an OER. When that is the case, you'll need to create an alternative. The alternative should be right there with the image. Don't make your users have to go looking for an accommodation, and don't make them have to ask for it. For flowcharts or process maps, use a narrative description which may be too long to put in the alt text, so you can embed a text file right next to the image. For things like charts and graphs, you can use a simple but properly formatted table. Don't worry about how inconvenient it seems to you to understand the relationships between the numbers that way. Blind people learn to do it better than you can. And besides, the perfect is the enemy of the good. For audio open educational resources, you will need to provide an accurate transcript. It should include not only what is spoken, but who is speaking and any other sounds that convey information. Put the transcript right there with the audio. Don't make people look for it or ask for it. If you need to create a transcript for an OER that you find, ask the Office of Accessibility Services for help. For video open educational resources, you probably already know that you need to have closed captions. These need to be actual closed captions and not merely subtitles, which are sometimes called open captions. The difference is that closed captions can be turned off which is necessary for some people who can't concentrate with the extra flow of information. Also, the closed captions should not be the automatic kind. For one thing, automatic captions often have errors. For another, they don't indicate who is speaking and they don't convey information that is conveyed in audible but nonverbal ways, like laughter or computer error sounds. In videos, everything that is conveyed visually must also be spoken out loud. If there is visual information that is not being adequately described, then you will need to add an audio description track. This can be done in software like Handbrake that adds an additional audio track and syncs it to the video. 
The tricky part is composing the descriptions and fitting them in between the other audio information. If you are creating an open educational resource, it is easy to make sure that all of this is accomplished by planning thoroughly and speaking from a script. If you are using an OER that you found, you may need to add these accommodations. If you need help with that, ask the Office of Accessibility Services. Games and simulations are especially prone to accessibility problems. The biggest and most unfixable problem is resources that use Adobe Flash. Unfortunately, there is no way to make Adobe Flash resources work with screen readers. They're just unaccessible and can't be made accessible without converting them to HTML5. If you create an open educational resource that is a game or simulation, be sure to work with the EdTechs and the Office of Accessibility Services to make sure that you are not creating accessibility problems. If you are using an OER from another source, every use case of the OER will have to be tested for the accessibility of the content and the navigation. Make sure all the controls work and make sense with keyboard-only input, and all of the information is conveyed verbally for blind people and visually or textually for de deaf people. There's more to accessibility, far more, but this is a good start, and it is enough for a subject matter expert or an instructional designer to be dealing with, as long as you know that there are experts you can and should bring in to your more complicated OER creation, adoption, or adaptation projects.